Hello, this is Hawk to Bean, and today we are going to be reading uh, some r slash d d horror stories. If you like this video, please like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Now let's get right into this. With the first story, Flair doesn't want us touching his fictional gold. Howdy, howdy! Been a while since I posted this sub since I got most of the real bad ones out of my system. This is a much tamer story from the I High School tabletop group days. Details will be sparse given the time, so I'll try to cover the important highlights. Our cast is DM, Bard, me, Cleric, and Fighter, the problem player. I can't recall enough about the other players to list their classes, but there were at least two to three others. My bard was a homebrewed Udmorfog-esque species, with the defining traits being their price of scales and absolutely awful such self-centered demeanor. Just an unapologetically vain and greedy fish, the party cleric who worshipped the banks was devoted to greed, so that to bond over their her mutual love of money. At the party's request, the duo got put in charge of budgeting wages and important purchases, all the while making jokes about cutting salaries and reducing shares based on how many spell slots the cleric had to waste on healing. This never happened unless it was okay to out of character, because no one actually had money. It was a party loot pool. There was nothing we could actually do to mechanically harm the party fin financially. So it was all for the sake of RP. Cleric and I would place outrageous bets on the outcome of encounters, toss over loot, and overall, and had an overall great time. And then comes Fighter. Fighter had either just joined the club or had switched to this game, and so I troubled the moment the RPing started. Singling me yeah, specifically, likely because of the somewhat grating voice I used. They threatened my character and tried to push for UEP, saying out care that they won't deal with such a shit character screwing over the party. DM explained to them how the loophole pool works and that we didn't actually have any say in the distribution of funds. But they just give me this pul this pouty -y glare, I almost said poultry glare, <laughs> and check out for a few minutes. This will pop up again about two or three times, two or three more times over that single session, whatever the cleric and and I made in-character comments. When Cleric asked why they weren't being threatened too, Fire said, You're next. I just want the stupid fish out of the game first. They were moved to a different game during the next club meetup. Honestly, should have kicked them out. That was a little bit toxic. And yes, we're risking it. OBS has had an update, and now the, um... The um, sound bars look really, really neat. Kind of like how they look. Anyway, Edge Lord Vampire wants wants to be a vampire, regardless of how the rules work or how it impacts the game. Turns out she's never had a character sheet and has just been making up numbers the whole time. Hmm. Hey Reddit, this is something I'm currently dealing with at my table. I am the DM, and we are not playing D&D, but rather a game I have been designing myself for a few years. It's built off the rapid fire system I am in, and I am in the final playtesting phase of building my system. Also, I'm on mobile, so I apologize if the autocorrect is weird in some places. <clears throat> I have several players from different walks of life. We play over Discord once a week. This player, let's call her Kim, and I have been and friends for over for a few years. She has actually played in a game I've run in person, but ultimately had to remove because her and her boyfriend at the time were sort of a terror at the table. I thought this was because they were emboldened by each other, but that's a story for another day. And then if I allowed her back in, and after a breakup, she would conform to the current social vibe at the table. Obviously, that was a mistake. In 
assuming that someone would conform to the oh, social vibe is kind of assuming that someone can detect vibes I can't with my autism I just can't unlike all the others at the table Kim was a popular girl when she, and young she's loud and confident and always up for anything these are traits I love about her and our friendship and con Text that I think will help explain where I'm coming from. So the setting is high fantasy, and classes pretty much da fall down to a healer, a wizard, a rogue, and a tank. Kim the Vampire. In my settings, vampires are victims of, of a virus that have lots of tank abilities, but they don't have to drink blood unless they get to zero health. Then they frenzy and, and bite whoever is closest, while... That is not how you spell the bite. That is not even autocorrect. They have a trade off style. Oh, or power structure. So if they choose to be hurt by the sun, they get a cool vampire er, er, power in exchange. More weaknesses equals more power. Okay, on to the story. So in session zero, I explained the tone of the game, and that would be more serious than my other games. I told everyone I'd require them to take basic notes and just basically pay attention. For context, my usual style is episodic format with a self-contained story every week. This is more traditional D&D style, and I explained that at the time. I everyone built their characters, and Kim's vampire became part of the, vamp the secret vampire church. Vampires are largely just folk or in legend for for most people in the setting. So it's important for her to keep a low profile if she's going to act as an agent slash, ass slash assassin for the church. This was all discussed. <sighs> Session one, she walks into the tavern, we see other her party members and proceeds to ask who else is in the tavern. I describe a few genetic, I mean, generic NPCs, and she declares she wants to seduce one. She proceeds on a long, rambling, hair-tossing diatribe to an NPC, and asks him if he wants to get out of there. He agrees, and she takes him behind the Ivar, and attacks him to feed. At this point, both the other party members and the men drinking with their, their victim realize something is up, and everyone heads outside where a larger fight ensues. The players kill most of them, uh, men, rob them, and frame them for burning down the stable, something they did for a separate reason before fleeing town. The adventure continues. Stuff happens, and the players get robbed by a man. They then hunt down said man to get their gold back. She then drags him into the wood and kills him to feed, even though I've explained that's not necessary for her character. Cool. You're just a murder hobo. That's a valid choice, I guess. She also insists on sleeping in closets or foot trunks because vampire. She wants to play the stereotype. The entire time she has been flirting with just about everyone we encounter. And not a I'd like to roll to seduce him, but a long graveling thing that takes minimum five minutes over the entire table is forced to watch. She becomes more and more frustrated each time I'm, because it often doesn't work and she complains openly at the table. Why isn't it working, you ask? Because if it was a straight rule, I set the difficulty at 6. D6 based system with modifiers. 6 is a uh, difficulty. And then I up or down the difficulty based on your roleplay or other factors a bit here and there. And I've been upping the difficulty for her because the things she says to the NPCs makes me so, so uncomfortable. An example from last week's game. A lady in the village is saying with her friends discussing a recent attack on a village. Feels like a vampire may be stalking the streets. Kim walks up to these women holding a huge scythe and doesn't introduce herself. Doesn't even say hello. She just starts saying things like, Don't worry, my lady. I will not allow anyone to do harm to someone as lovely and fair as yourself. It will be my honor to defend you and protect you from this terrible creature that has been stalking about in the night. 
my lady has nothing to fear from the darkness. While I am here in town. <sighs> the NPC is, from my perspective, so I put up of as she was having a private conversation with her friends, and this strange lady just walks up. Also, Kim does all her role playing with a Russian accent, even though all the characters are from the same country. I make the difficulty 8 because of this, and her total is 10, so the NPC is happy to know a powerful mercenary is there to help. Even though Kim is a small blonde woman dressed as a noble, but she does have a huge sight, so that's something. A sight, I should add, she bought in the hidden village of werewolves where she tried to seduce the werewolf farmer to give her the sight and then got angry on camera when it didn't work. Because vampires and werewolves are not friendly with each other. <sighs> the thing about these interactions is that she often wants to roleplay them out and it takes her a very long time to say anything. So the entire table has to watch her flirt with a pretty much unwilling NPC for a long time. The other thing is that I've generally discussed how I don't like the tone of my games to be too adult. I keep things firmly PG-13 and I've spoken about my aversion to anything adult, too adult at the table. I have been a player for 20 years and I was very often the only girl at the table. Firm boundaries were always my friend. This has got on so long is less of a story than a rant, but it all boils down to that I rolled deep with the NPC layer I described out above. The this role seemed odd to me since the game has no visual sheet in World 20. Kim has just been rolling a D6 and verbally telling me her modifiers to get the number. I asked her to confirm her stats and something seemed off, so I asked her to send me her character sheet. We keep them in Candor for easy editing and access. She said one, one, one minute she needed to add her numbers to Canva. That she'd been keeping a printed out sheet. And when she sent me her sheet, it was just with the column skills filled in and nothing else. I immediately could tell her numbers were wrong. She had way more skills than she should. And when I asked her why, she said, I roll off once. Info, we have a crit fail system in this game. If you roll 1 and your total number is less than 4, you can request a critical failure. Something bad happens to your character for failing so hard, and you get 1 XP towards the skill you failed in. Cam has requested a... Crits fail all of once. Later in the episode, she says she had 160 gold, and it also seems like way more than she should. So I watch three recordings. I record all my games when my players got unsent, so I can go back and check what I named people or places in the moment, and basically she's adding a different mod of fire to the same role all the time. If someone asks if she can do something that only works if you have X ability, she always says she has it. But then she just never uses it again. I'm so pissed at the disrespect. I work hard on my games and she can't even be barred to read the rules what was paid for her class and make a sheet. We all built characters in session 0 and she sat there with her camera off and pretended to be making a character sheet. And it cleaned up some of the many typos. And I love the emotes there, because that's so oh the mood. Like, kick this, this player out. They're clearly cheating anyway. Okay, next story. DM making the campaign unplayable. There is so much going on here, and... I need to know if I'm the crazy one here. 
So, my boyfriend and I really like D&D. I've been playing for seven years, and I taught him to play it when we started dating three years ago. But he absorbs information like a sponge, so at times he knows rules better than I do. This is important because we've been playing with a group at a local game store, and things have gotten a little crazy. I ran the first campaign the group played through, and it was ridiculous and fun, and everyone had a good time playing. I want to work on a sequel, and had mentioned I miss playing, so one of the other people decide they want to run Curse of Strahd. Dang it, these always get a D &D horror stories on them. And I think Curse of Strahd can work really well, and you can make it really funny. I personally had already run Curse of Strahd and knew most of the story already, but no one else had, so I decided to keep my mouth shut and enjoy being on the other side of the screen for once. I went with the Gnome Barbarian because the combination sounded funny to me and I thought it would allow me to slip under the radar when the group was coming up with plans since I already knew the story. No one asked the Barbarian what, what the smart thing to do is. My partner came up with this concept for Connor's wizard who claims to be the most powerful wizard of the age when really most of his magic was supposed to be illusions. Both really fun quirky characters we were both really excited to play. This is where it all goes downhill. The DM almost as soon as we get into Arovia overloads us with magic items. Way too powerful for our level 2 party. Our rogue, who is one of his childhood friends, currently has 12 magic items. Most of them rare or higher. I got a belt of storm giant strength before we had reached level 4. The amps and start are messing with the monsters. We had to fight, a, fight the group of vampire spawns in one of the shops, and they all had ACs of 23 on top of having double hit points. And all their other abilities. We fought the yeah, about the other day. He had an AC of 27, 300 plus hit points, and 3 5th level spell slots. He also apparently has an ability that required a strength saving throw of 30 to not be pushed back and off the balcony. My boyfriend and I are also sure he's lying on his rolls. Not only have we seen his rolls come through on D&D beyond much lower than what we get told, but we also went through a combat encounter where he had rolled a 6 nat 20s against me, and only me, which seems really weird. He has not missed a single attack or failed a single saving throw, no matter how hard the DC or how many times my boyfriend does so revives. He also does max damage possible on every attack, plus 20, and it pretends to be he's, he's surprised when I go down. I'm trying really hard not to make a game because I already know the story, but this isn't even all the things that has happened over the course of the campaign. I'm really starting to not want to play anymore. He's changed the Eroka cards on us, so we don't have any leads for anyone any, for anything anymore. He completely cut out the scene with Irina and Kretesk to force us to drag her around the rest of the campaign so he can have a, a DMPC. He only gives the quest to one person no matter how hard me and my boyfriend try to get one. It's ridiculous and I really need to know if I'm in the wrong here for being upset or if anyone else agrees with me. Edit. My boyfriend wants me to add, add a few things. One of our random encounters had been a greater zombie with an AC of 25, only because we had one really well placed type chain and fireball from our wizard. We keep not knowing where to go because halfway through the quest, the DM decides to change the location. Me, the gnome, and our cleric, who's a centaur, both can't get anyone to talk to us because obviously Vyrovians Bar are racist. Like they've never had a gnome come through before from Strahd, so no NPCs help us, and I can't trigger the main quest I want to do, and they instead all go to our ranger who won't tell us about them. I want to bring in new characters, so I've purposely been, so I've been purposely trying to get my character uh, uh, killed.
I've run the book before, I know how to do trigger stupid shit. And I keep getting told they don't happen because he doesn't want us to lose Arena. That does seem like a new DM thing. I mean, heck, even I'm a new DM and... I'm not going to freaking take an actual story character and make them into a DMPC. You make your own. And then you give the players the glory if I later having them die. That's what I did. And also, it gives them another reason to ooh, um, fight the big bad. Losing friends over D&D? &D? That seems to happen a lot. I started a campaign with a group of friends last, last year sometime, and I thought we were all having a lot of fun. I've actually never DM'd before, but I really wanted to give it a try, so I volunteered. My DM friends were excited to get to play it for once, and everyone got excited to get to play with me because normally that never happens. We set up a night and everything started out smoothly. Everyone knows I'm new and has been helping me navigate it. In the middle of the fourth big quest, something happened to make two of the players very upset. But instead of coming to me and voicing in this issue, they started acting wildly out of character and were an adamant on killing an NPC while my other party members got increasingly more uncomfortable. There is a part where one of them claimed that they were saving their highest level spell slot slowly, slowly to one shot what I'd said it was a 9 HP townie, basically. I understand having boundaries as a character, and I tried literally everything to resolve the situation. I can't go into it because I assume they both read Reddit, and I'm so too afraid to discuss this with them as a whole because I don't have the words to describe my own hurt from this. After a particularly problematic session, I took them aside and asked if we could talk about what happened, and they told me that I, that they felt I was taking away their agency by not letting them kill this NPC. And I reminded them that this campaign was a group effort. They can attack whoever they want, but the other players do also get a say in what happens. They hemmed and hawed a bit about how they all tried to have in-game conversations about important stuff, and when it came down to it, the NPC wasn't killed off. We have a lawful good person and she just wouldn't stand for it. And also, why would you want to just kill a random NPC? What the heck did they do? It's felt like ever since that session, these two friends have, dr have drifted, drifted away from me. Now I have to mes message them first to have any sort of conversation and sometimes they just pretend to forget D&D night altogether. When I asked once more if everything was okay, the answer is that it was as an overwhelming with toxic positivity. My biggest issue is that it's fine if they're not having fun. I'd happily release them from the campaign if it made them more comfortable. Our friendship went from us watching shows or movies or playing games together to just being on a call and talking about nothing for hours, just not hearing from them for weeks. Recently, one of my friends pulled me aside and told me she was upset I wasn't talking to her as much anymore. It implied that I spent too much time with our other friends. Truth is, those other friends messaged me first. We have real conversations instead of those toxic positivity sessions where she uses therapy terms to pretend we have a healthy friendship, but something has started feeling really off about it. I'm starting to get the feeling that she uses her knowledge of mental health to manipulate others, and she's been trying to isolate myself from my friends while distancing herself from me to force me to run to her. I don't know, it sounds crazy and I've started to feel crazy lately. Maybe I'm too overworked and I'm really the one at fault. Maybe, but sometimes it's like she slips up and I feel like I'm seeing her, the real hero for the first time. Bitter, jealous, and controlling. ETA. Basically, the NPC was a super eccentric scientist who did some less than ethical things that upset them. By the time I approached him over it because I refused to voice their frustration for weeks, it was too late to change anything. I tried to fix the situation so it was better, but there was only so much I could do without their help. 
Eventually, they were given an item that would stop the unethical frax access, and the wife asked if she, if she could use the frax the unethical experiments. I'll admit, I was frustrated with this, it's not okay unless I do it mindset. I've had to deal with people that act like this before. Where they um, refuse to message you first and then get mad at you for not ever talking to them. Like, I don't like that because I'm literally autistic. I don't know oh, if I'm going to be bothering you by messaging you first. And I don't want to ooh, 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 do that to someone you know. So I assume that if someone wants to talk, they'll message me first. And also, when you don't talk to me for months on end, and then you suddenly appear or getting in, in mad at me, I'm not, not very happy about that. Either way, there seems to be a lot of uh, toxic stuff going on with those two friends. Especially that one that was using a therapy word to try and make you feel... Oh, 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 like something was off and to manipulate you. That was... That's sus. You should probably... Cut them off at this point. They're intentionally e e trying to, um... <sighs> get you to leave your friends for them or only hang out with them. That's not okay. Anyway, brand new player. I'm sure if I was unfair in leaving. So, it's been a while since this happened, but I came across a subreddit and I've been wondering if I may have been unfair during my first game I was in. Oh god, this is a long one. I thought it was going to be way shorter. Sorry if it's long, but there's a lot of things that happened. The story goes... I was playing as a young tribal half-dragon warrior who was born in a cult sect of dragon worshippers. I was effectively a spellblade who had affinity with melee weapons and ice magic. With a fairy dragon pet, because of the draconic blood, I was able to use a two-handed weapon one-handed with no penalties, which sounds like I'm really powerful, but I got beat quite easily in the first couple of fights. A few things I distinctly remembered or was a ghost-like creature came and, n and sliced me nearly in half. I had to somehow convince my the DM to not kill my pet because I would lose my affinity for magic and my I had draconic blood, but there was no idea that we could get them killed and was told they're basically flavor. Don't kill your flavor's pets. Especially if they aren't actively a part of the combat. Like, I have heard so many horror stories where DMs just kill pets. Oh, I can't get it, it on tangents with this one. This one's already a long one. I came up on a town and saved them from a bunch of people, but because I was raised to believe that we of the tribal cult are to help and not expect a reward, right, so I saved them and the poor town gave me and the party a 6,000 gold value statue each. I turned down the thing with my backstory, but then they sent like every young woman from the village to be my servant, and I wasn't able to handle it, so I said, Can I go back to the statue instead? He said no, and you can't reject them, because they would see it as a failure to pay their debt and sacrifice themselves. Finally, he didn't realize I was uncomfortable and instead sent a full dragon and woman. Keep in mind, in this setting, we can look completely human, relieving them of duty in a way a, a, they will be fine, but now she's my future wife to be. I'm like 16 at this time. I was just uncomfortable with stuff like that. Thankfully, after a while, she left and only was a minor annoyance from time to time with how often we had to talk with her again for what she knew.
There were also multiple times where I would get a rare item that would work for me, but then for some reason, someone stole it or a cursed item that I was forced to use. And it wasn't until other players started getting absolutely pissed that I literally couldn't do anything that opportunities for me to correct it come up. The worst examples I would have, have to give are, are I had a magic sword that I spent a lot of money and found very high up. Pe people to help me make a cursed spring. And it showed up. And it's supposed to make the magic items your full origin just completely awful. Random dice rolls, you know, but the dice rolled in my favor. The cursed creature instead blessed it by making it an Omni elemental weapon that can change the elements at any point. I mean, verbal gives me a danger sense, and if there are any vampires nearby, it repulses them and makes them violently ill, no matter how powerful they were. But it had a side effect of uh, only I can use it, and it activated actively. It I can use it if it actively uses illusions to protect me from harm, and anyone but me that touches it without, without my permission faces a debilitating curse that act, acts contradictory to what they're good at. Examples perfect stealth character makes a lot of noise. God damn, this is a long one. I feel like there's a lot of details here that are not necessary. The issue, the issue arises when you realize the main villains of this story is a sect of vampires that want to destroy the world. You would think this would give us an advantage, and does, but it also completely destroys the story as the vampires are in hiding, and literally any kingdom that had sees a vampire would instantly attack them on sight. So I basically have an ultimate vampire detection system item, and by the de vampire detection had an effect radius of half a football field all around. I didn't get to use this weapon at all. I had it for two sessions, and without a roll, oh, without being able to stop it, it nothing, it ultimately made a stealth character stuck up behind me, locked me unconscious, and stole it, selling it to an NPC who was a queen of snow, and the only way I could get the sword back was by stopping her kingdom from melting. That was her curse for touching it forever. Forever summer. And no matter how many times these are successful roles I or anyone made, the answer was always the same. You may have it back as a reward when you fix the curse plaguing my kingdom. The answer that was told an exhausting number of times with successful, convincing rules was that the only way to remove the curse was returning the sword to me. Rather than doing this, however, or the GM um, just said, okay, we look, we can and just remove the vampire or thing, which I would have agreed to because even I was thinking that's overpowered for the setting. I would have been more than happy to remove that effect and keep the rest, but instead of that, the GM refused to give it up and then had her become a permanent enemy of the party until I was dead. Which never happened because I was an ice creature, so she couldn't kill me. But she kept par targeting party members and hounding them. Yeah, it seems like you're completely fair in leaving. This seems like the DM gave you an overpowered item and didn't know what to do with it. And you could have just said that. The main reason as well I was told for or why they wanted to do this was because I was just to hold a more powerful weapon. I thought, okay, cool. The weapon was the Dragon Slayer. A sword explicitly designed to violently kill any dragon and whip them into a bloodthirsty frenzy. I'm a half dragon. Every time I saw my own weapon, I went crazy, lost control of my character, and focused on nothing but trying to break the weapon. Oh, also, I had a magic cursed gem that was forcefully implanted in my hand. I was supposed to awaken the power of this sword, but if I didn't get the gem my ha my hand first, I would permanently lose my hand in place of a sword that makes me want to constantly kill myself with it. 
But don't worry, it gets weirder. Yeah, buckle up. Somehow we're not at peak yet. Eventually, one of the NPCs of the party decided they wanted to test her, her transformation magic and cast it on me without my permission, and I had no possible way of resisting it, resisting it, because I didn't know what was happening, because I saw her magic shoot through a tree line without make, making any accuracy rolls and hit me. And this turned me into a full dragon. But I couldn't turn back, so I said, okay, turn me back to myself, and it turned me into a half-dragon. But I was out cursed to permanently look like a half-dragon, which would get me executed because dragons are evil in this setting. Which I didn't know about until now, by the way. Then I said, okay, give me the power to turn back into a human, which then permanently cursed me to be a full human. Eventually, when I finally found a way to get back to the point, and I was, oh wait, the character failed to roll, so now I'm permanently stuck as a human. But, oh hey, guess what, I can still use the Dragon Sire Sword. Okay, well, you completely threw my character out the window, undermined every possible decision I made up to this point, and ran all my stats and things I respect act for complete worthless as in a week. What does the sword give me? Do I get to channel all the raw might of the Infernal Dragon? It's a plus one great sword against humans or any other race, and does verbal dr damage to dragons. So it's a 2d6 sword that can and cut through dragon scale. Oh, and also keep in mind, I'm not human. I can't do a wield this 200 sword with another. Or when getting my stat benefits. So now I'm say or to or do willing and using a you know, 200 sword. So I basically have a chance, percent chance to hit and about 1d4 damage. And I was supposed to be the one to kill the dragon boss, by the way, somehow. The boss that's a nice dragon that does more damage to humans and has its own moral while sending against like his own kind, even half half reads, which I'm no I'll no longer a half breed. Yeah, already I would be leaving. That's not the only cycle or pro that's not the only problem I ran into. We found a bug that gives us infinite knowledge, but we have to know the right questions to ask it. Our pal then asked it how do we kill the dragon boss. I responded with only one born of draconic blood from the boss tribe can ask this. Oh, I guess, oh hey, so cool, something I can do. Ooh, I'm born of draconic blood, and that's my tribe, so I ask it. Only a priest or priestess of the tribe can ask this question, as it is outside your rank, hatchling. Okay, how do I become a priestess? Only those of priests or priestess rank or higher may ask this question. You must find a way to become worthy before I can tell. Okay, how do I become worthy and get this information? You perform the ritual of iconic binding. Okay, cool. How do I do the ritual? Only a priest or priestess may ask this. Okay, screw it. My mom's alive. I've been destroyed. She's a priestess. Ask her. Sorry, I can't tell you. Okay, no longer being a nice kid I was. Sorry, I just find you lose my mind and character. And lay into her about how she wants us to kill the big bad thing. This big bad she start or the whole thing. I can't do any of that until I get the information needed to do it. I admit, I was starting to get annoyed out of, of game, but you'll never guess what the ritual was. The ritual of draconic binding was a ritual where I sacrificed my own life and allowed my draconic father to possess my body. Which will give me the information required to kill the boss dragon. Guess which dragon my father was. That's right. This whole time, I was a child of the dragon we were trying to kill. No one at any point or at any way decided to tell me this. Instead of me trying to find a way around this, I kept finding yet another cycle where I couldn't progress my character out or the story using my plot thread until that cycle broke. Uh, which was impossible because they required to break the cycle in order to break the cycle. And finally, because no, this is not the end, I finally managed to that resist any kind of attempt to possess or kill me. My dad would have buried the dragon sight sword so I can actually do something against him, found a way to adjust my set so I can better wield the weapon, and I was doing nothing roleplay-wise except preparing for the next five game sessions with grand NPCs that were yet another cycle problem from trying to well, figure out how to help me. But for us, we need to fight the final boss 
and the game master ended the session because he was bored and started a brand new game session with the whole new system. This became a great thing, by the way. I didn't get all my power game gear that's supposed to help us kill the final boss until either the final boss was, just, oh, was dead or just before we either ending the session or if I got it real early so big mythical oh, magic traps up for the eyes or maybe in table using them. I got a goddess in one day we were playing at falling gods trying to reclaim our power. I woke up with a sword in my hand because it just got teleported into my hand. No one knows what happened but guess what it also teleported my axe because it's jealous. Oh and it's a bronze sword with no redeeming qualities. Don't worry though, that's my weapon until 15 game sessions later when I find a normal human axe. We come across the location where my god axe was, and we're about to grab it. Worry in session because we're making a game. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. It's just awful. This was such a liable occurrence that the second anyone saw me get a good magic item or an item that's for me, the other players checked out a session and started making a new character ideas for the next game. Or have early they started stockpiling money and weapons so that I could replace and have something. It was also a normal occurrence that I I almost never got to roll against things that made no sense happening without questioning. Hey, this known online grip I mean all that uh, you were forgetting to help you on a task and you told everyone to never trust him and your entire private fortress is to no one trusts him. Well you left in a fortress prison for about five minutes and he somehow convinced everyone that every single player character is actually an evil doctor or getting her clone and they all dropped you instantly. When you come in, but they don't trust the other partners. Okay, but why? I got the grace of being allowed to bruise some of the as a, as a story. But I'll tell them your command officer is really obviously a distrusty liar is lying? Huh? These are all such a common occurrence in every game. The other players take steps to mitigate the problem, but he's signal that we're moving to a new game. Eventually, I just said, screw it, I don't want to part the main story anymore. Because they're a side character. And it led to me getting less magic items, abused by other PCs, and used scapegoat for the against the party. He's vicious. I can't do it anymore. After four years, I left. I really want to continue to role-playing games, but I just couldn't find a group. Everyone I know was too busy to find them. And more years passed, and I'm still hoping that maybe I can find one. But I haven't played so long, I don't know much about it anymore, or even if I have a lot of time to do it. In question. So I guess the long and short of it was, am I being unfair here? Should I have just stayed? Was I the one in the wrong? Yeah, that DM was objectively a bad DM. Like, every player deserves their agency. What that DM did was objectively not okay. I mean, that was r slash D&D Horror Stories. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. I have no idea what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, so until then, goodbye!